Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. My dear friends, as we begin this second night of our Lenten mission, let us pray for the grace to hear the word of God with the ears of our hearts. Good and gracious God, we place ourselves before you as we begin our Lenten journey. You call us to a life of conversion of heart. May your word proclaim for us this night, lead us more deeply into that conversion of heart, despite the obstacles, the distractions, and all the things that draw us in other directions. Be our guide, our light, our peace this night. We ask this through Christ our Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. I then, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love striving to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. One body and one spirit, as you were also called to the, to the one hope of your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, he ascended on high and took prisoners captive. He gave birth, gave gifts to men. What does he ascend it mean, except that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the extent of the full stature of Christ, so that we may no longer be infants tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching deceitful scheming. Rather, Living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament with the proper functioning of each part brings about the body's growth and builds itself up in love. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen. I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink, a stranger, and you gave me no welcome, naked, and you gave me no clothing, ill, and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison? and not minister to your needs. He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. How are you doing tonight? Huh? Well, you know, I want to give you all an A plus for bravery. You came back. I see, you know, I put this thing so straight and so direct. You all would be chicken out and wouldn't come back, but I'm glad to see you have some hardy people around. Excellent. Because we're trying to look at missionary discipleship. We try to understand how we get from where we are to that destination point. And part of that destination point is understanding that we become the missionary disciple that God calls us to become. You can't become a missionary disciple like me because you have a different system, <laughs> vocation. <laughs> A different vocation and I can't become a missionary disciple like you because I have a different vocation and vocation remember we're talking about the onion rings and I'm starting with the inner circle first which is our our personal vocation how God has called me from my mother's womb how God has known me from before all eternity 
Today we go to the second level of vocation, which is how we have been called to use the gifts and talents that we have been given for the building up of the body of Christ. So the second level is how we are called to use the gifts and talents we were given for the building up of the body of Christ. Our gospel reading today is a fearsome text, isn't it? When you hear that text, what do you feel? Come there, man. What do you feel? Huh? When you hear that text, huh? Guilt, nah, man. Questioning. Now, all you want me to do the walk about it. I see all you want to sleep. All you forget that this thing is not about, uh, you know. Yes, sister. What do you feel when you hear that text? And she looking at me and saying, "You can't be asking me that question." <laughs> you know. You know what I mean? What do you, what do you feel? Hmm? You don't know, sister. What about you? Huh? Do I ask you that question? When we hear this text of the great judgment with the sheep and the goat and accounting for our life and accounting for what gifts God has given to us, it should be a sobering moment for us. It should be a moment where we are stopping and thinking and asking the hard question. How are we using the gifts and the talents that God has given to us? How am I using the gift and talent that God is using, is giving to me? And the text says to us a framework of our life that we will one day have to account for the gifts and the talents that God has entrusted into our hands. And the reason why we have to account one day is because we are not the owners of this thing. This thing is a gift that has been given to us from, from God. And because it has been given to us from God, it is entrusted into our care, into our hands, into our life. And therefore, we one day will have to give an account, and that's the primary meaning of stewardship. It's the primary meaning of stewardship. If I am an owner of something, then I could do with it as I want, and nobody could tell me anything about it. Correct? If I mistreat it, that's my, my problem. If I'm so foolish, I have a nice car and I don't give it service and I do all kind of foolishness with this car and I own the car, that's, that's my problem. But if the bank actually owned the car and I've only destroyed the car, then I have a problem because the bank will be after me for the money that is theirs for the car that I'm driving. You understand the difference now? So we have everything on trust. And because we have everything on trust, ultimately it belongs to God and ultimately we will account to God for it. Everybody with me on this? You can see this? You're saying yes? And this is an important first point. And here's why. Because many of us go through life as if we are the owners of everything we have. You, you, you want me to break that down for you? Huh? You know, if God gave me the gift of a good voice and I could sing like a nightingale, and every time I sing it, I basically very proud about my voice and how I sing it. And, and I tell an audience, look at me and look how nice I am. Then what am I doing? 
I'm praising myself. I'm acting as if I was the one who got this voice. And I'm not understanding that this voice is in fact just a gift that God has given to me. And therefore, the praise and glory should go to the one who gave the gift in the first place and not to me. You with me now? And, and this is true for everything. You know, is there anything that you could claim as yours outright? Think about it. Is there anything that you could claim that is yours outright? Anything at all? What about the jersey on your back? What about this jersey? You could claim that that is yours outright? Huh? You buy it and you work for it. Correct? But you see, this, this, this trend that made this jersey required a technology that you didn't invent. And the stitching required a technology that you know nothing about. And you can't do it yourself. And therefore, all the pieces that make that jersey up really are gifts and inheritance from generations past and people we have never met. Everything we have ultimately is a gift. Everything we have is gift. And everything we have is a gift either from people we have never met or from generations that have gone past. The, the, the microphone that I'm using, I can't make this microphone if I try. And therefore, the fact of, of having the microphone means that I am indebted to people whose brains were such that could invent something like this to amplify my voice. Therefore, I am indebted to them because it is a gift of their talent that allowed me to use this microphone. If we understand that everything that we have is a gift, everything, everything and you know part of, 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 of the gift that you have comes straight from the DNA of your mother and father you know that you can thank them for a lot of stuff good and bad <laughs> good and bad but that comes as a gift from them but the, the, the spiritual gifts that you have been given are gifts from God given to you for purpose and the, the first gift and the most important gift is the gift of love is the gift of love and that's what the final judgment in Matthew's gospel is about whether you love God enough especially as you saw God in the distressing disguise of the poor did you recognize him? Did you have the spiritual eyes to recognize that it was Christ who was present to you in the poor? Did you see him present there? Or did you just see a poor person go by and look down on that person as a, what's the, use, what's the word you're using in the Bahamas? Huh? Jones up. All right. I learn a new word every day, you know. A Jones up. How we see other people is really our bad. Because that person too is a gift from God. That person too was created in the image and likeness of God. And that person too has a spark of the divine in him or in her and that person too is a reflection of God's glory and God's mercy that person that we write off is a way that God is using to communicate to you and to me you with me so if we understand that the key in the second level of discernment, the key is the understanding that we are stewards of the gifts that God has given to us. Then we start off 
by understanding that we are only stewards and everything that I have, everything I have, yeah, your money too, eh? Yeah, your money too. Yeah, the house you're living in. Yeah, the car. Yeah, the glasses you're wearing. Everything we have is in fact a gift to us. And we are stewards required to take care of this gift. And that means we have to use it in a particular way. Anybody ever lent you something that was precious to them? Hmm? Anybody ever lent you anything that was precious for them, like a car? Yeah? You borrow your, your friend's car. How you drive it? Yeah? Very carefully, yeah? Different from how you drive your own car. Not so? Why? Oh, because it's not yours. Oh, uh -huh. and you're afraid to bounce it. Because how that go look? And you borrow the car, your bouncy car. It ain't gonna look good. We understand that when we borrow something precious from somebody else, we, we take different care from it. But if you went and rented a car now, eh? Huh? You're driving it worse than how you drive your car. Things you never do with your car, you do it with the rented car. True or not true? Oh gosh, I catch you all out now. Why is that? Because it's not yours, it will never come home to haunt you, and if anything go wrong, it's their problem, not yours. So now we have three distinctions here. The difference between something that I own and I have a long-term responsibility on it, something that I have in trust, that I have to give an accountability for it, and something that I are using that I have no responsibility for. And you see, we treat the three things very differently. But remember, the key gift that God has given to us is the gift of love. And this one is a hard one. If we are assured, if we are assured of God's gifts, then we have to act in a particular way because we have them on trust. We have it on trust. You know, and, and I, am, I am pretty sure that this does not happen here in the Bahamas. I'm pretty sure about that. What oh, happened? I see somebody closing their eyes. I don't get, I don't, what, what, what wrong? I, no, 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 the good, the good holy people in the Bahamas would not, would not be doing these kind of foolish things. You know, there are some, sometimes in other parts of the world, not here, where, where people are put in charge of a ministry. And next thing you know, they, they start to act like if they own the ministry. But not here, not here. They act like if they were installed there by God for life. And, and only God put them and only God could move them out from there. Y'all don't get that in here, do you? Eh? No, 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 no man. Not the good people of the Bahamas. Not at all. That's impossible. That's impossible. You see, a person like that is acting like an owner and not a steward. And because they're acting like an owner, they actually become a gatekeeper, keeping people out of the ministry rather than bringing people in. And, and that's the opposite of stewardship. That's like driving a rental car. That's the opposite of stewardship. And, and the ministry that was set up to do a, a specific purpose now is set up to serve this person who is running this ministry. And the pastor or the priest, he prayed him to touch the person because he knows his head will go first. Now that is a person acting like an owner. How does a steward act? How does a steward act? A steward would keep asking what is the purpose of this ministry? What is the purpose? What is God's intention for this ministry? What does God want out of this ministry? And the steward would then 
Go and do everything possible to ensure that the ministry fulfills God's purpose for God's people. Because a steward is a servant of God and a conduit of God's grace to God's people. You all hear me? So now we have a, a second distinction I want to put in your mind. The difference between an owner of a ministry and a steward. You have that distinction clearly in your mind? You sure? All right, good. You see, brothers and sisters, we are supposed to be God's fellow workers. We're supposed to be God's fellow workers. But you know, many times we start acting like if God is our fellow worker. Like we have the program and it's God who holding it back. You know what I mean? No, no, you look like you don't know what I mean. Let me, let me break it down a little bit for you. You know, sometimes when we pray, we start to boss God around. You, 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 you hear me? Lord, you see today? This is a serious one. And, and, and you done eh, heal my auntie from yesterday already. And you know, you know I've done talk to you about that twice. Don't, don't make me make it three times. Eh? And, and you see today I go in long town, you better give me a, a parking space. Eh? Because you know how, that, how hard that will be. And uh, you see this one, I need you to heal this one. And, and yeah, the, the, the mortgage coming up and I find you getting a little bit slow on this thing. Eh? What you're laughing for? Serious thing and all you're laughing. Sometimes we act as if God is our fellow worker. As if we have a better plan than God does. As if somehow we have special insight that God didn't get us yet. And, and when situations come up, we sometimes act as if we have the best possible solution to this. And God is the obstacle to this solution. Talk to me now. Help me out. That is not being a steward. That is not being a steward. That is not being a steward. Because the problem is, is a problem of arrogance. That, that we could actually believe that we know more than God. That we are wiser than God. That we are better off than God. And that if God would only get to our program, the world would be actually a better place. That is sheer arrogance. That is as, as, as arrogant as arrogant can get. And many times that's a disposition that we take. To be a steward is to be invited into a different disposition. And to enter in in a very different way. And that's what our first reading from the book, from the letter to the Ephesians is saying. Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your vocation that you have received. As a prisoner of Christ, I urge you to live a life worthy of the vocation that you have received. Are you hearing this? I urge you to live a life worthy of the... That... Worthy of the vocation that you have received. And Paul is assuming that everyone in that community had a vocation. Because he's writing to the whole community of Ephesus. And so I am urging you, I am urging you to live a life worthy of the vocation that you have received. When God called you, God graced and gifted you. And he gifted you and graced you for mission in his church. And when you experienced what it was to become a child of God through baptism, and you came into this community called church, you were specially graced 
and called by God for purpose that only you can fulfill. You are given a specific set of gifts and talents that only you have. And that set of gifts and talents is for the purpose for which God has called you. And they are to be used in a manner that is fitting for the vocation that God has called you to. The model of the church in, in Ephesians is a model where the whole people of God are called to mission. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I realized that the mission of the church was about the priests and them. And when I asked a little bit about who the and them is, they say, well, that must be the nuns and them. Not so, sister. The whole people of God has been called to holiness. The whole people of God has been called to mission. The role of the priest is to help you to find your vocation so that you can be a worthy minister within this community called church. One of the challenges that we have with the Catholic Church today we have some good 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 Catholics you ever meet a good 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 Catholic I learned that, that from a fellow well it was from his son because he said he described his father my father is a good 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 Catholic when I said well, what I mean well he came to church four times in his life when he hatch, when he march, and when he dispatch. <laughs> we sometimes think of the church as a club to which we belong. And whether we are there or not, we belong to this club. That's not the model of the church. The model of the church is that we are all fellow workers with God, participating in this mission of building God's kingdom here on earth. And that means that we have to get up off of our <coughs> chair. Well, I don't know why you all those things came out. I was only talking about chair. I was only talking about chair. All right. We have to get up off of our chair and start acting as stewards of the grace that God has entrusted into our hands. This model of church where the whole people of God are called to holiness, have a vocation to holiness, the whole people of God have a vocation to which they must respond, is a model of church where every single Catholic has a role to play within this church. Because you have been given gifts and talents that we need for the building up of the body of Christ. The other day I was doing an, an appeal in one of the churches in Barbados, the bishop's appeal. So I, I said to the, to the parish, I said, you know, I have good news and I have bad news for you. So give us the good news first. I said, no problem. The good news is that we already have all the money for bishop's appeal this year. Man, they broke out into applause. I said, the bad news is that it is still in your, your wallet, it's still in your checkbooks, and still in your bank accounts. That's the bad news. <laughs> that tickles somebody over there. <laughs> now, if you're here, Archbishop, Pat, bid the use that next year, you know why. <laughs> We have every bit of talent we need to grow the church in the Bahamas. We have every gift that we need for the building up of the kingdom of God here in Bahamas. 
We have everything that is required for what God has asked of us as church. And the challenge is that the gifts that God has given to us are not yet being used for the building up of God's body. They're still sitting down in your... This understanding of church brothers and sisters is that your vocation is a central way of your experiencing your participating in church through your vocation, through the way that God has called you. Hear what Paul says. As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The first thing that Paul talks about are these four qualities that I don't know, when we, I think they went out of the door with Adam and Eve. Hear them again. Be completely gentle, humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. To be a steward and to answer your vocation that God has given to you, we have to start with humility. We have to start with humility, with gentleness, with love, with patience. We have to start from a different place, brothers and sisters. Because one of the challenges that we all face is that when we come to do something, we want to do it either my way or true? Serious? That's how that's all this cut it down here? My way or the... Yes? Uh-oh. I would have never guessed that. And, and that's not what it is to be a steward in God's kingdom. To be a steward in God's kingdom is to be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The reason why the gifts and talents that God has entrusted into the community are not being used for the kingdom of God is because some of us have not been gentle, humble, patient, and loving, and therefore we've turned people away who have gifts and talents to offer. And if that is true in your life, and if it is true that you came to offer yourself and your gifts and your talents for something that the church needed and you weren't received in the way that you thought you should have been received, I want to say to you, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I started there. Sorry. And then I want to say to you, grow up. Grow up. Because we have to learn how to forgive. And we have to learn how to bring the gifts and talents that we have back to the body of Christ. Because that person who hurt you, or who turned you off, or turned you away, who acted like a gatekeeper, they weren't being who God wants them to be. And they weren't living out of their best selves. And that should never stop you from living your vocation. And that's where humility comes. That's where humility comes. This model of church is a church animated by mission. That's what missionary discipleship means. That we are animated by mission. That it is Christ's mission that really allows us to live everything that we are called to live. And we bring ourselves to this. We, are, we don't have volunteers in our church. We have full-time ministers who have other jobs. Say ouch now. And the reason for that is this, that if we are connected with Christ, then our primary identity 
is in using the gifts and talents he has given to me. And, and that's what should be occupying my heart and my mind. And, and tomorrow we see, and if that means that your vocation is marriage, that's where you have to bring your gift and talent. To whatever your vocation is. But here today, we have to see what is the gift, what is the talent that God has given to you for the building up of Christ's body. So hear what Paul says. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. Say that with me. Make every effort to keep the unity from the bond of peace. I know, I know, not the church in Bahamas. I know, I know. But you know, sometimes we Catholics could make bacchanal confusion and break up things without even pausing. But not here though. Not here. Not here. Not here. For the Catholic Church, unity is the highest good that the church is called to. For us, the church is a sacrament of unity or communion. The unity of the disciples. Does that mean we always have to agree with each other? Does it mean we always have to get along? Does it mean that we always have to do things that pleases everybody? But what it does mean is that no matter what we have done and how we have gone, at the end of the day, unity is more important than the thing that we are doing. Because if in our ministry there is this unity, then our ministry itself is an offense to God. And Paul says that in, in Corinthians, I could have the this, this sound of an angel, I could speak most eloquently, but if I have no love, I am nothing at all, I am a gong booming and an empty shell. Remember that love is the highest call and love is the mission. Love is the mission. The mission is to build a building. The mission is to love. And so we can't mash up everybody, beat down everybody, break down everybody to build the building and say that we have achieved the mission. The mission is first and foremost the love. Everything else is in alignment with that and supporting that because that is the mission. And that is what it is to be a steward. So when Paul says here, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, Paul is saying something really important. He's saying that whatever else we're doing, keeping good relationship between ourselves is the first thing that we are always doing. Can you hear that? Mm, boy, you could say, oh, she's all right, she's all right. Love and unity is what we are always doing. That's what we're always doing. And this is important, brothers and sisters. This is vital because the depth and the strength of the church is by our commitment that we have to love one another. Everything else flows out of that. And sometimes I believe that in the church, we miss this key point and we do fantastic things with people whose egos can't fit into the room. And therefore the bouncing egos all over town and everybody gone away hurt. That's not what we were called to. We were called, as Paul says here, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He goes on. There is one body 
one spirit, just as you were all called to one hope when you were called. One Lord of faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The reason for the unity, for the communion, the reason for the keeping together is because we belong to one faith. We have one God. We belong to one community. And there's only one Father and one baptism. They don't have a baptism for you and another one for me. When I was baptized, I was baptized into this family. And that means that I became your brothers and sisters through baptism. You know they say that blood thicker than water, all the other say? You know that is a lie? No, it's a lie. It's a lie. Baptismal water has to be thicker than blood. The bond that we have through baptism has to become our primary identity and that bond which has made me a son or your or daughter of God means that that becomes my primary identity and that means you are my brother and you are my sister. The bonds of baptism become the primary identity that bond us together. When Paul says there's one body and one spirit, this is you've all been called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Then he says three wonderful things. This Father of all is Father of all. Not Father of some. He's Father of Father of all. God is Father of all. That means that we can't pick and choose who we're going to love. Because that person is loved by God as much as I am loved by God. So therefore when I don't love that person, what am I doing? I'm saying that I am not really being God's son. You with me? Hmm? He says that this God is father of all. He is over all. Which means that all, all people come under God's headship. All people are under God. All people. But he also says, he's over all and through all and in all. That God is all in all things. That this God, this Father that we, that we have, this Father is everything. And who are we? We are the ones that God has called to be his children. He has graced us with a treasure that is so amazing and so great that we can't even begin to understand the gifts that God has poured upon us. And if we understood these gifts, our response to God would be so, so different. So, so different. He says, but each one of us Grace has been given as Christ appointed it. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And now he's talking about the different gifts that have been given. So the gift that I have as a successor of the apostles is different from the gift that you have. I didn't get the gift of music. That's your gift. I have gifts that you don't have, but together we make up the body of Christ and together when we share our gifts and talents, we make up Christ's body and we fit Christ's body for this time and this place. 
have you been worried about the church and the, the way that the church is not necessarily growing right now anybody worried about that yeah you worried about it you worried about the way that our young people are not necessarily sticking around that's happening to y'all that the children and the grandchildren are checking out somewhere in the late teenage years that happens here you worried about that well let's stop worrying let's stop worrying let's start living our vocation because if we start living our vocation then God will will use the gifts and talents that he's given to us for the building up of this church here and we will have everything that we need for building up this church stewardship is a different concept stewardship is a concept that God has given us everything that we have and how I give it back to God is an important part of my relationship with God you know one day a chicken and a pig were walking down the road it was early early morning and they were walking and when they reached about eight o'clock the chicken said you know i real hungry the pig said me too so they saw a place there that was serving some nice food so let's check in there and see what we could get and when they checked in they saw the famous thing in that place was bacon and eggs so the chicken said to the big man let's have some bacon and eggs i hear this thing so good everybody talking about it the pig said you're right you know for you that's when you're offering for me that's the whole hog <laughs> we are accustomed to thinking of what we have and giving an offering to god you know what I mean? As opposed to thinking that everything I have is really God's and asking God, how does he want me to use this, these resources that he has given to me? You understand the difference? In one case, it's an offering. It don't touch me. It don't hurt me. I'm gone. In another case, it is that everything I have belongs to God and I should be consulting God in how I'm using my time my talent and my treasure the three T's of stewardship if we can't give back to God our time then we're too busy if we're not giving God our talent then, then what are we doing if we're not giving God our treasure what are we doing you know I tell people when when I was a child and I went to church. My mother would always put a dollar in my hand to give to the offer tree. You hear the, the word for it? The what? The offer tree. It's an offering. And I would put my dollar in. And then during the week, she'd put a dollar in my hand and I would go to this, to this corner shop to buy milk and bread. And the milk and bread together used to cost a dollar. 45 cents for the milk and 55 cents for the bread and we used to yeah, yeah it was one dollar i used to pay one dollar and, and and for the milk and the bread and come home and mom got the milk and bread for breakfast that same milk and bread today would cost about 15 dollars but we still put in one dollar in the collection You didn't see that one coming. <laughs> we still put in a dollar in the collection. We still dealing with it like an offer, like an offering, as opposed to as, as a sacrifice. When Paul says, 
to equip the people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The intention of this model of church is that each Catholic becomes a mature Christian, a, a mature disciple, a missionary disciple and each one of us understands our responsibility before God for the gifts and talents that God has given and entrusted into our hands now today I not I not preaching milk this is milk you know when you buy cigarettes they have a little note the surgeon general warns you this could be dangerous for your health I think they should have put out a little warning. This could be dangerous for your spiritual health in a positive sense. Why should say this should be this could be dangerous for your ego? That's a better warning. This could be very, very dangerous for your ego or your pride. Brothers and sisters, we have to stop playing Dolly House Church with Dolly House teacups and Dolly House saucers. Because we in the real game, and this is a big league, and we have been called in a time that is unlike any other time in the history of the church. And we've been called to a task that generations before have not seen or experienced. The church is changing and the world is changing rapidly before our eyes. And 50 years from now, we will not recognize civilization. And, and the rapid rate of change is unlike any other era that we have had in recorded history. And the only way we are going to get through this time and have church that we could be proud of is if we are willing to get up off of our and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The responsibility for your formation is yours, not your priest. He is responsible to ensure that he guides and leads you and gives you what you need. But you can go online and you can take a course online here and there. You can find good Catholic sites. You could take the Compendium of Social Justice and read it. You can take the Cat Catechism of the Catholic Church and you can read it and study it. And you can build your faith up and build your knowledge of the faith up. That's your responsibility. The days when we say, well, you know, Father ain't teaching me, and, and what do you want me to do? Then it's done. Because you go to Mr. Google for everything else. He's asked, if you don't know how to make sweet bread, you go and ask Google how to do that. Any, any dish you want to make, you don't know, you ask Mr. Google. Why can you not go to Mr. Google and ask about the faith? Why aren't we consulting about the things we don't understand? And why aren't we looking for good Catholic literature and reading consistently so that we are building ourselves up in our faith? Once you become an adult, the responsibility for growing in the faith is your responsibility. There are great books out there that will help you in growing and they're not hard to find anything by Matthew Kelly is usually amazing short chapters really to the point giving you between your eyes and helping you to understand how to grow faith if you go to the dynamiccatholic.org website if you go to, to catholicanswers.com you'll get every answer you need for all your friends who are not catholic for the questions they're asking you that's your responsibility because brothers and sisters if we are to be the church that god wants us to be then we have to become much more not knowledgeable about our faith we use a lot of time on social media not so hours and hours a day Imagine if you took one of them hours every single day and invested that in reading a good Catholic book. 
One hour a day. You know where you will be at the end of a year or three years? You'd have grown in your faith. You'd have grown to see and understand the church differently. And then you'd be ready to contribute to the church and contribute to this great challenge that we have in our time. In the Old Testament, they talked about tithing. And tithing was given a 10% of the first fruits back to God. We don't ask for tithing. We don't. In fact, when in the Old Testament they talked about tithing, they had three different tithes that they had to offer. One was the first fruits, then they had to do a second tithe sometimes for support of the priests, the second part for religious festivals, and some every third year they had a third tithe that they had to give. And, and that one was an offering for the temple and for other things like that. When the Jews ended, at least 20% of their income was given back to the support of the church. 20% was given back to the support of the church. What percent of your income is given back for the support of the church? Hmm. Ouch. 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 As Catholics, what we tend to do is give a little offering here, give a little offering there, and if there's something big, we might give a little more to that, and we keep going along the road. I'm asking you to become intentional in your giving. I'm asking you to become intentional in your giving. When I was 17 years old, my father was very ill. At one stage, they had given him about a week and a half to live and then they discovered a miracle drug that had just been on the market and just been tested and approved and they got the drug in and they tried him and he responded to it and because of that response he lived another year and a half of his life during that time after he had done that recovery he called us together and he said you know I can no longer work but I am opening an account because we're going to live by faith. And this account, we're going to call it God account. And 10% of everything that comes us, into us as a family, 10% we're going to put it in that account. I said, all right, 10% of zero is zero. I could. I could live with that. And every two or three months, you'd call us and say, look, this is what we have in the account and this is what we're going to do with it and tell us which charity he was going to give it away to and every couple of months this thing would happen he had to go to Canada for surgery or for, for medical treatment and when he went to Canada the hospital he went to was a research hospital and his ailment was so unique that the doctor said no 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 we can't charge you because it's a teaching hospital we want to use you to teach our our students about this ailment we don't get to see this very often that whole treatment in canada cost him 43 canadian dollars for one set of medicines that they happen not to have in the hospital at that time and over and over again everything that was needed happened everything that was needed and, and over and over again i just saw the provision that God made for our family but that was because God my father put God first and, and, and took out 10% of everything that came first and told us about it so that we were part of this conversation and part of this living and I am sure that that's the roots of my vocation because I saw that kind of faith in my father I was willing to give the 100% of my life to God We have to understand that as Catholics, we have to grow up a lot. We have to grow up a lot. We've been spoiled. And we've been allowed to, to live in ways that really have not stretched us in our faith and grown us in our faith. 
and, and to be assured is to be grown in your faith and that means that you can't be shy in being generous to God because you cannot beat God in generosity you cannot the more generous we are with God is the more generous God is with us up to today I practice giving away more than 10% of anything that comes to me up to today find a good cause and, and, and up to today I make sure every single year when the year is ended that I have given away much more than 10% of everything that has come to me personally and why am I doing that because I want to make sure that what I'm telling you is something I myself am living and I'm also saying to you that God's generosity is always more than any generosity I have managed to give and I challenge you to be generous with God I challenge you be generous with your time the things to be done around your parish that you have the talent to do and you are holding back the parish by holding back your talent from the parish the things to be done in our church and in your workplace and you are holding back God and his kingdom because you are not being generous with the gifts that God has given to you when we live as mature Catholic people then our lives are a witness to other people who start to ask questions about the faith because they see us being so different And the ministry God might be calling to you might be anything that might be in the public eye, it might be so quiet. But if that is his call to you, please be generous to God. Be generous to God. This image of church is that every single Catholic, animated by mission, becomes completely animated and involved in the life of the church we will no longer be chair warmers anymore but we will be people whose lives are given generously to god and god's kingdom that's what it is to live vocation on the second level it is to find your purpose for which god has created you and to be generous to god in fulfilling that purpose there is something that god is asking you to do there's a ministry in the church that needs your help and your talent there's something that you are required to give do not hold back on god do not hold back on god the more you give is the more god will give to you pope benedict before he retired in a talk he was giving to the roman to the diocese of rome he introduced a new concept, the concept of co-responsibility. And he said the laity are co-responsible for the mission of the church. That's a term beyond collaboration. In the term collaboration, if you want to collaborate with me and I decide I don't want to collaborate with you, but tough for you. With co-responsibility, even if I don't want to collaborate with you, you still have a responsibility for the mission of the church and for building up the, the, the church as a body of Christ. You still have that mission. You still have that responsibility. You still have that as something that God has entrusted into your hands. This whole text ends by speaking about unity again. When it says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work as each one of us does the work that God entrusts to our hands the whole body of Christ builds up to maturity stands up as a strong 
as a strong body that is invincible because we are Christ's body here on earth. The second level of vocation as we consider stewardship, the gifts and talents God has given to me, the way to grow in your faith is to commit yourself to ministry. Commit yourself to stewardship. Commit yourself in giving time, talent, and treasure. Commit yourself to reading and praying. Commit yourself to your life in Christ. Because this, brothers and sisters, is the most significant life that we will ever have. And this is what gives our life significance. When we grow in our depth of Christ in Christ Jesus by giving ourselves completely to him. That is where we really find the depth of, of our call. And that is where we experience what God has intended for us from the very beginning. I want you to hear this text from Pope Francis. Pope Francis says, We will never discover the special personal calling that God has in mind for us if we remain enclosed in ourselves. In our usual way of doing things, in the apathy of those who fritter away their lives in their own little world, we would lose the chance to dream big and to play our part in the unique and original story that God wants us to write with him. God wants something from each one of us are you courageous enough are you courageous enough to enter deeper into this relationship with god to get up off of your chair and to dare to dare to give yourself to jesus christ in a deeper way are you courageous enough are you man enough are you woman enough to live this life of grace that he's entrusted to us and to live it intentionally and to live it with generosity of spirit are you ready to rock and roll with god because god is ready to rock and roll with you and god is waiting on you and waiting on you to say yes and to step up to the plate and be generous with him Amen. scriptures reveal God's plan for us as we journey with Christ. Let us pray that his path of life may become clearer to us each day. Our response after each intercession is, Lord, renew us in your spirit. Lord, renew us in your spirit. That all leaders of the church will guide us in lives of faith and service. 
We pray to the Lord. That the leaders of nations may reach out in peace to the poor and the outcast and bring an end to hunger, violence, and oppression. We pray to the Lord. That all assembled here this evening may strive to inspire each other with our kindness and true humility as followers of Jesus. We pray to the Lord. That the Holy Spirit will guide us in the work of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ so that all may be one. We pray to the Lord. That God will continue to call compassionate people to serve the needs of those who are sick and suffering. We pray to the Lord. That our gracious God will hear the prayers we now offer in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord Almighty and ever loving God, we place all our trust in you. Sustain us in our time of sorrow and answer all our prayers. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Each year at this mission, we take up a collection. The purpose of that collection is to pay for the cost of the mission. So we now have the collection for the, the offering being taken. <laughs> As we bring our offering, let us sing hymn number 102, Walk in the Light, 102.
at the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say,
May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wish all of you a safe journey home, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night.